Hello, good evening. Um, we are um, live um, doing another sister webinar with a, an amazing lineup of human beings. Um, the topic is back yourself. And to be honest, you don't get much of a stronger trio than these three. And as before, basically before we went live and people kept appearing into StreamYard, there was me, Danny came in and there's me and Danny in our active wear just going, yeah, whatever evening and then Naomi Fresh from George in. Asda. exactly <laughs> Naomi <laughs> came in and me and Danny went oh fuck honestly what is that <laughs> outfit and we're like yeah totally. and we're like nope we're still backing ourselves and then Marilyn came in one minute to seven and I mean look at her <laughs> Popped her red lip. She's got the incredible <laughs> glasses on. Stop <laughs> it, you two. Exactly. Girl. So the, the theme of back yourself has already started. Um, in that I'm yeah, I'm gonna stay in my pajamas and casual wear. Totally yeah. well, we have yeah. Danny Wallace, the who's like biog is all over the place. The Queen Bee, aka the Queen Bee, um uh Founder of Fly Anyway Foundation um, and the host of Show Up. I would get it in the wrong order. I have to read it. Show Up, Wise Up, Rise Up. <laughs> so, yeah. good morning. Show um, Up, Wise Up, Rise Up, Drink Up, all of it. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> all um, exactly. Amazing coach and with an amazing story herself, who, yeah, came from a very bad place and decided to get her shit together, basically, and show up, wise up, and rise up. Um, Absolutely. And Naomi Schiff, who, I mean, honestly, again, it's sort of one of my, if I, if people say to me, Mike, who's one of the most badass, who's the most badass person you've met? I'm like, well, there's this like racing driver, female racing driver, who's also a James Bond and various other films stunt driver, who's just cool. I mean, that's just, it's just cool. It's just a casual day job <laughs> so, you've got there, so Naomi, many just levels. a casual why, day job. Why you do, why you do, that's you do. <laughs> um, and then Marilyn Acora, who actually I've known since we were about, Fourteen, because she went to school with my brother. She was like, "I was like, Reg, we've got Marilyn on," and my brother's like, "Who's Marilyn?" I'm like, Mazza, Mads. And then okay. uh, <laughs> is, is and yeah, are, are you a triple Olympian? Triple Olympian. Triple, triple, triple Olympian. Yeah. I mean, I think once you get past two Olympics, it's like whatever. I'm Olympian, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, climb the mountain twice. It's all good. <laughs> exactly, whatever. Olympian. <laughs> you run fast. Um, PMGB um, sprinter, um, as I said, three Olympics, um, and has just basically just stepped down, just retired from. Um, and so, in the next the next chapter of your life, which hung on, why I'm talking about that? How? Because it's only had when I asked you to do this, I hadn't realised it was literally pretty much the week that you had announced yeah. um, retiring. So, how how are you feeling? on that with, with one identity and you're now going into something that you know how what, what what went through your mind because actually it is in line with back yourself because you had to make that call to stop and to get enough and yeah. how yeah that sort of ego all over the place self-awareness all over the place like yeah, yeah. it was like, through it <laughs> once i actually committed to the decision it was the best decision of my life it's like one day left loads have opened so i'm currently on a mission to revolutionize the culture of sport globally which is so exciting i think a lot of athletes are waiting to find something that is going to give them that same sense of purpose and drive um but really what i want people to you know transition happens to all of us at all different stages and i think what's up with the sporting world is that you're not preparing for that early enough um, so for me, I had a really hard 18 months, you know, I mean, like our last panel, it was just, you know, my journey has been set back after set back and that's fueled me, to be honest. And I really wanted to go to Tokyo. I really did up here, but my body was knackered. And then as all the kind of indecision started and one second it's going ahead, the next second it's not, I had to actually sit down and say, is this, is that going to be the kind of Olympics I actually want to run at? And it's not, I don't want to run in an empty stadium. I'm training all the way by myself, away from my family. That's not what my last two games have been like. So once I started to think about, you know, what is it that I actually want? Am I actually doing this for me? Because I was actually doing it because a lot of people kept saying, one more year, one more year, seven years later. Um, so when I finally thought, actually, I don't want to run, which happened December 31st, I felt so free. Um, and actually, it left me that emotional space to 
to really figure out what it is I want to do in the next season. It's just been amazing so far, hence the red lipstick and the leopard print, because I feel fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so it's liberated, yeah, liberating on that. But what, um, does it, yeah, so all of you, that the drive in all three of you is, is unbelievable. It's sort of, you know what I mean? It's like you get the energy just over like a, over the screen and that doesn't happen often i always say you, you get energy when you walk into a room and you certain people radiate energy but all three of you just have a presence and have an energy and like so danny what have you always had it like where where does it come from i think that there was always a performer in me so before anything before my business happened that i was always a performer i was always an extrovert but i always misconstrued and people around me always misconstrued my extroversion for confidence so i would often seek validation from outside myself quite often um it was it was really difficult actually because inside i didn't hold myself in a lot of regard i didn't hold myself in a high regard and it was really really difficult and it was only years later through a lot of learning, a hell of a lot of learning, that I realised that the validation had to come from myself. I did this um, really cool exercise, actually, at an event that I did, um, where a lady took us through a meditation. And the meditation was that you would meet a future version of yourself. And the future version of yourself like, ha is hanging out in the house that you've created for them, with the life that you've created. And in her hand is, the bo is a box. And the box is a gift that you've given them. And the gift that you've given them is everything you've done for them. And it was in that realization that I realized that that future version of me really loved who I am. And the now version of me really loves who I was and that person that you know and we've talked about this before in different different ways but I'm a survivor of domestic abuse generationally situationally from um you know from my from my dad and and nanas granddads aunties uncles to relationships that I've had and then I was homeless that I look back on that person that survived that and came through all of that and I realized just how much I love her and how viciously like I viciously love her that right now th that that confidence is coming from me and instead of it being an extra version that I'll always have I'm a little bit jazz hands and I'm a little bit out there and that's okay yeah. but the confidence is the quiet knowledge and acceptance of yourself and that took that realization to to know that I absolutely have my back that the person that I'm backing is me that when I'm stepping into the arena the horse that I'm backing is me and I know that I'm able to perform then that's where that confidence comes from. It's the knowledge and acceptance of my abilities and seeing future me love me so viciously and loving past me so viciously. That's where I kind of get mm. that right now. And you don't want to let down the past me. You don't, you know, if you're having one no, she went through a lot. Day -day, you're like, she went through hell. And so, yeah, get up. <laughs> get up well, rise up and show up, isn't it? For sure. Yeah. That's where the whole thing came from. That's where the whole thing came from. There were things that I weren't showing up for in myself. There were things that I weren't learning. And so I wasn't achieving the things that I wanted to. So I had to learn the things I needed to learn, show up in my arena. And though it works like a formula, then I could only, I could only rise up. Amazing. And Naomi, you, um, because you're, you know, you, we've had this conversation um, before on that, you a girl going into racing driving which is sort of you know even you're now you know you're you're kind of sort of not a veteran but you've been in it a while and even now it's a sort of for younger girls um it's really tricky so what what did you have like when you were little like how did you get into driving and what did you what was the fire in you that made you go right this is what i'm doing and fuck everyone <laughs> and the doubters and <laughs> well, I must say, like I was quite, I was quite lucky with the way that I got into motorsport because obviously it's quite a, a difficult sport. There's a lot of barriers to getting into the sport, even at the low levels. Um, I was invited to like an indoor go karting birthday party. I absolutely loved it. I uh, did quite well um, and wanted to go back. And luckily, you know, I always say to people, I, I don't start my story by saying that my dad used to race because. There seems to be a misconception that if one of your parents did it, they sort of forced you into that direction, which wasn't the case at all. Because until that day, my dad didn't know that I had any interest in motorsports. But um, he was a huge part of, you know, giving me the confidence to to push in a sport 
where actually when I went to the track, I didn't see anyone around me who looked like me. So that was quite difficult as a young person, especially when you, I was about 11, 12, and that's a time in your life where you're like super socially conscious, you're worried about people's opinions, you know, you, you're developing yourself as an individual. So I, I really held on to the, the people around me who, who pushed me. Um, and more recently, I would say a lot of what I do, I do it because of young girls who, who potentially are like what I was like at the time. And I want to do it for them so that they have someone to look up to and say, okay, we can be like that because she's managed to do X, Y, Z. And the more, the more you've gone, the more successful you've become and the more you've kind of gone down that route, does, is there that voice in your head? And not, not the pressure, but the actually there's more and more people looking up, from it, up to me. And a bit like, you know, when um, Danny said, the old Danny, you don't want to let them down. You don't want to disappoint them. Is that is that something that helps like, drive you drive you on? That now your head's above the parapet, and you've got a lot of these people and little girls looking at you. Um, as a bit Absolutely. Of a hero. So, I mean, you could see it as some um, some sort of pressure, and to an extent, it is. But at the same time, it definitely is something that fills my fire because the more girls that potentially come up to me and and I can help and give the confidence to, that fuels my fire. Absolutely. And um, Marin, we all, it's like a similar, similar going into, going into track and sprinting and, and we've spoken about as that it's a lot of male coaches. So you're surrounded by, you know, male coaches, male managers, and actually Naomi, you would have probably had, had similar. Um, and how, yeah, I know you sort of with the body shaming and that doubt in you and how you, the perception of how you should, are meant to look and meant to be. What yeah. <laughs> what were sort of the battles you've had sort of growing up doing doing the racing, but also kind of fighting that societal image of what you yeah. should be? Well, first of all, I just love this panel because it's just <laughs> I'm so inspired right now. But you know what we are, you know, is what I like to call real role models, and whether we like it or not, we are there, and I'm, I'm glad we're here because there's so much so many sort of wrong role models that the girls are aspiring to. So I take that role really, really seriously. And it is my journey and I basically want to be, you know, I do a lot of mentoring, a mentor that I wish I had, you know, that could just say, hey, look, let's mine that pitfall and you know, prepare for this and, and you know, have thick skin here. I think with the world of sport, we're seeing, especially through 2020, like women in sport are just raising their game all the time however there is still so much work to be done and I was privileged to be part of the Women's Sports Trust Unlocked program um, and it was 41 female ambassadors of sports all different sports and it was just incredible we just wanted to make so much noise for, for women and what we're doing and, and, it, and it's so important because in my journey in track and field I'm actually a middle distance athlete so I look like a sprinter everyone thinks I run the 100 and 200 I actually run the 800 which is a crazy mix of speed and endurance. So yeah, you've got to be fast. I also run the four by four, um, which is, you know, a sprint, but also I've got to put the miles in. And so there's so many misconceptions with, you know, how I should have been training. And unfortunately I wasn't ever really training from a female lens. It was always what my male coaches had done before. And that was put upon me. Or the other thing was, you know, a lot of the girls that I stepped on the line with, I did not look like any of them. You know, I was, you know, <laughs> I was meant to be the spin I was a lot more muscular. Um, and, you know, I put it out in CNN about, you know, our head coach who thought I was too heavy based on just how he saw me. Yet he doesn't know anything about, you know, the 800 meters. So, you know, I had a lot. And, and to be honest, I'm used to kind of being the outside or the anomaly. But when I was growing up and being the only you know, black girl in school, it was still a nurturing environment. So it wasn't until I was an elite sport, it was actually used as something negative. And, you know, I've just done this incredible campaign with Cantu Beauty talking about my black skin and how proud I am of it today. But it hasn't always been like that. So me being on the track, and if, you know, someone else can see themselves in me and think, gosh, she's strong, that's what Serena did for me. I think it's just so powerful that we can be that visual representation of strength and backing yourself, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and how did you on on that being um you know not having because obviously go, go, as a teenager and teenage girl where you're so insecure and everyone is anyway and body conscious to have that that extra pressure of not looking the way you were supposed to look for doing a middle distance and doing what you do what how did you learn what were the things that kind of how did you learn to 
basically back yourself and go right god you all this is what did you kind of learn as you went along with the sort of the tips and things that no i was really really blessed um so obviously like i'm from nigeria and we're a very proud culture so until about 16 i didn't really you know think about it it was just you know i just owned myself and then when i was at stowe which was a beautiful school where i met your lovely brother um Again, no one put that pressure on me, but I just looked so different to everyone else. And the girls weren't really that into sport. And I was always training with the boys, which was great. And they filled me with confidence. But then when I was hanging out with the girls, it was just like, oh, who's got the thigh gap? <laughs> Not me. I've got a slipper over here. And, you know, I did kind of think, okay, maybe I would look more attractive to guys if I was a bit thinner. And, and you know, you kind of go down that route. But I had an amazing tutor, uh, Miss Hooks. And she was just like, look, you've got one body and you're doing amazing things with it and you know the guys think you're beautiful so why don't you think you're beautiful so it was kind of just that you know that self chat and that realization of having that person that was really kind of you know she was direct with me she's like you've got these goals and your body is the way you're going to achieve it so you need to start loving it and you know and so i kind of ran with that until i then came into the world of elite sport and you've got like performance directors which are dangling that purse and that you know your funding if you don't you know go on this diet so yeah it's been lots of peaks and troughs but eventually you just realize that i know myself better than anyone else and i have to live with myself day in day out nice and no and you're um in you know you you were in a very boys world man's world <laughs> in it did that did, did you sort of have that and in your head of having being that competing and i put we had something out in a just a sort of facebook group today about that whole um being told you're bossy or opinionated or um aggressive and you know all, all those kind of things it was a, a a battle in you to be feminine be a girl but you're doing this and that that sort of how did you sort of play play the game so to speak well, I think it's been a little up and down. I wouldn't say my strategy has been the same throughout. I think when I was very young, and I think you guys touched on it just now as well on confidence, the question of confidence. Um, in, in my sport, I think a lot, of, well, for me anyway, personally, a lot of confidence is social, well, connected to performance. So when I was, whenever I was doing well, I didn't really care what people thought, but maybe when my career wasn't going as well, I, I sort of thought, okay, um, is potentially my appearance part of the issue? Should I try to be a little bit less feminine? Because I am quite feminine. Like I, I am a bit of a tomboy, but I, ha I have my nails done. I have my makeup on. And sometimes when you appear that way, I think in our sport it's sometimes harder to be taken seriously, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a question of, like Marilyn said, you know, you need to back yourself and you need to do what's right for you. And if I feel the most confident personally the way I am, then that's going to show in my results instead of trying to be someone that I'm not. So um, I feel like that's where I'm at with it now. Um, and, I, and I'm proud to, to be me, really. Nice. And Danny, what about, um, what about you? Because as you said, how did you snap out of that cycle that that cyclical is one of that generational domestic abuse which you yeah. don't you know it's sort of in your bones um mm -hmm. and being homeless and how what yeah how did you snap out of it how did you sort of when was that point where you just went no it's not interesting it. because we are carried within our grandmothers right so biologically if we look at every baby when they're formed a female baby within their ovaries they have all of their eggs we are carried within our grandmas i think i find that phenomenal and crazy but within our dna things that have happened to us ancestrally we bring through with us so things like poverty things like race things like the way we are treated all of this and where we were where we grew up is is where we had always been as a family so these these are real generational cycles that we're breaking the the way that women are treated with within my community wasn't great. They were either, um, we either had to be hyper feminine in order to be seen, in order to be loved, in order to have sex, in order to do all of those things, or we had to be super masculine and roll our sleeves up and work really hard with our noses to the grind. And, and kind of like Naomi said, be, being sort of having to masculinate ourselves in order to get through and get by or to climb the corporate ladder if you wanted to go and work in an office and you wanted more for yourself, you'd have to masculinate yourself in order to navigate that. And I think that for me, the owning of myself as a woman and being okay with the fact that I couldn't really 
pinpoint where my femininity sits because some days I'm feeling super feminine I'm gonna put on a dress and I'm gonna do my makeup in fact every time me and you have hung out Emma I'm putting makeup on of some description I'm always putting my wall paint on ready for battle but the that I don't really see, and, and then I'm like heavily tattooed. I wouldn't be described as sort of super feminine in any one particular day or super masculine in any one. And I kind of sit around with my energies like that. And I think that owning that was really, really important because, as a, I mean, as a performer, the um, I was never going to be a perfect pop star. I was never going to walk into one of these places and and like the, the X Factor, for example, and then suddenly get myself a place on a girl band. Like I'm just, I'm not. I'm average. I'm okay at singing and I'm average looking and they weren't going to ever put me there. And these these values that I had, or they weren't even my stories. We are sponges as kids and we absorb these stories from our parents, from our friends, from our teachers, from the magazines, from the news. That, that all of these stories I had to realize weren't true, that that we are able to own our boundaries within relationships. We're allowed to own the fact that, you know, we can say the words, I love money, I love abundance, I love health, I love sex, I love all of these things. And allowing myself to own those boundaries became me breaking the cycle because actually within within those historical relationships and those cyclical relationships that's what the people would come back to relationships weren't safe for our women they, they just weren't safe for our women so they conformed they sat within mother they sat within matriarch these powerful women like my grandma was a proper battle axe she was amazing like mm -hmm. proper really strong woman but was made small. She was the homemaker. She, that's what she had to do. And I was sort of, I came onto the scene and I looked around me and thought, I want more. I can see more. I can be more. And then there's that weird teenage, early 20s bit where you're trying to work it out um, and getting it really wrong. And then so as, as, I, as I hit my 30s, and I think age has a lot to do with this, whether we like it or not. And this, the more we get these sorts of messages with these incredible women out there and you out there to the as younger and younger young women, we get to know ourselves quicker. It took me a long time to know myself and realize that they were stories, this cyclical behavior wasn't even my story, wasn't even my thing that I was playing out and taking back the ownership was really important. So that was the, that was the thing, like the, that bit of age that hit in my thirties, I was like, oh, okay, I don't have to put with bullshit. Good. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> and, it, and, and that became, and that became what this became. And I am the queen bee. It's that reclamation statement that I am the queen bee, as are you, as are you, as are you. Yeah. Just tell them, um, I love it. The whole, where did the queen bee come from? The whole bee. <laughs> The B analogy. There's <laughs> two. So one, I was, I'm, I, I'm going to swear, I was really pissed off that the Queen was born the Queen and that I was born on the council of states of press. It really, really annoyed me that people were born into abundance and all this sort of stuff and I just wasn't. And and I know, girls, I know you'll get me, like it's just mind-blowing how there's such a disparity for everybody. It really, really riled me. Mm -hmm. And as I'm sort of researching, how can I monetize the space that I had in the week to, uh, I was singing at the weekends and I wanted to do more with the corporate experience that I had. We were watching the uh, B movie and there's this quote in the B movie and it goes, aerodynamically bees should not be able to fly. Their little wings shouldn't get their fat little body off the ground. The bee doesn't care what humans think is impossible. The bee flies anyway. And that, like, I clutched my pearls. I was like, whoa, that's the, that's the one. Yeah. We need, we, it's a decision. And for all, it's not a decision for a lot of us. We're starting out. As we move forward, it becomes a decision. And the more that we move together and the more that we link arms, bees do this thing called festooning, where they're building something new. They link arms. The more of us that link arms together, the stronger that we become. And that's what I'm excited about now, is that more conversations like this happen. You know, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I've got so I can hear three small children fighting downstairs. But I've got Did you not see my arm doing this? No, 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 I can't hear them all on this, but I'm not sure if they're coming through loudly into, into this room. But they're there. They're there. <laughs> Lurking. Um but in um the the whole kind of backing yourself, when you have the little the doubts, the voices in your head, and we did a like an imposter syndrome panel um last week, and that comes into it. In, into into backing yourself because that self doubt. What what like Naomi when because you know you doing the stunt driving in the James Bond film, which is really freaking dangerous, quite frankly, You're and you could die. <laughs> I know I'm such a fangirl, um, and you could die <laughs> at any point. But what 
what goes through your mind like when that fear that you know i call it the fear bubble when you it sort of and you go it hits you you think what the hell am i doing i'm going to be found out or i'm gonna you know i can sit there and have my fear bubble and not risk death what goes through your mind um and how do you yeah, sort of how do you get out of it well so i was quite lucky i went to a very good sports psychologist when i was very young and I always used to get very nervous before every race. And I still do. It's quite natural. Um, but he was really good at telling me, you know, the symptoms of fear or nerves are very similar to those of adrenaline. So like Queen Bee was saying, it's all a mindset. And like it's, it's something you can change so easily. You can change the narrative of things and give yourself that confidence just by saying, OK, what you're feeling right now is normal. It's your adrenaline switching on. Fear, fear is fear is information. You can't give it power. Um, so I, I, I used to do lots of little tricks, you know, and 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 promote myself to myself before every race. I would tell myself, "You're the best driver. You have the best equipment. You're gonna win." And and give myself that confidence, and that in itself in itself calmed me down. So it's all a question of, like you say, backing yourself, but also um, making yourself believe in yourself. Sorry child <laughs> hang on a minute Braff, if you're gonna sit here sit here quietly yeah. you've got no chance ems you've got no chance i've got it <laughs> <Say hello. laughs> Hi. Hi, Hi. 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 Yeah. Just, please <laughs> um hang on a minute danny i'm gonna will you just take over yeah i've totally got it i've got you back okay. don't worry it's so funny and i'm marilyn you were nodding along there as well like you no I've no <laughs> doubt at all. And as a and as a performer about to get on stage, and when you're when you're sharing, when you're speaking on stage, you're you're positioning yourself as alpha. And that's what we all do within our fields is position ourselves as alpha. When you do that, actually, there are there are psychologically like two different outcomes. One is that everybody accepts it and everybody's safe and you win and that's brilliant and you're definitely alpha. Or if you are not alpha, then everyone will turn on you and they will kill you. But that doesn't happen anymore because it's it's illegal. But the bits of our brain hasn't caught up with that yet. Yeah. The limbic bit, the animal bit of our brain just hasn't caught up with the fact that, you know, like like Naomi said, you've got the very, very best in safety equipment when you're doing what you're doing uh, marilyn you're trained and trained and trained you're a powerful person with proven record that's not what we tell ourselves in the five seconds we before go right mm -hmm. so I so true you know it's, it's all about preparation isn't it and you know much like naomi was saying when i was confident i didn't give a shit what anyone had to say i mean my running style was my racing style was heavily heavily criticized because it was different and I love being different. It's like, you know, we all unique. And, you know, when I was super confident, I just would be in my zone and just have that unwavering faith that I could deliver. However, when you had a little niggle or, you know, like you just said, when it's not gone well, and then the whole, you know, nation just goes, ah, oh, what did you run like that for? And like, what did you do that for? It's your yeah. fault. You know, we, you know, we just come off on the side and you're trying to breathe and the BBC are just like, what happened there? Like, what do you think happened? You saw, I didn't do well. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, self-chat is so important. And I always talk about champion mindset, which is for everyone. You know, you don't have to be an athlete to have champion mindset. It's just being willing to pull it together and realize that fear is, it's its not a reality. So then you can draw on your reality and hey, what are the truths here? I've got the best kit, I've been training, I've, put, I've been getting up at six o'clock to make sure I'm prepared for this. Um, and I'm not turn on you and kill you. And I'm not gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I actually used to say to myself, I used to get stupidly nervous like every race, every race, what, and I used to, you know, in the season you're racing every weekend, I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? I to remind myself is because I chose to be here and I'm damn good at it. So get on with it, girl. <laughs> so yeah, it's like just you know, bring that reality into it. What is actually real? And on the other side of your fear, you know, two minutes after a race, I'm like, yes, that was the best thing. Let's do it again. So <laughs> you live for those moments, not the moments beforehand. It's the bit afterwards, isn't it? And it's chasing that next one. Yeah. Emma, we were just extending what you were saying to Naomi about what about that self-talk beforehand and getting yourself in the right frame of mind. And that as a as a um as a sports person, as somebody goes on stage regularly, we all feel the same fear. It's the it's the same stuff that's firing off and when we recognize it 
we get to tell it to sit at the F down. There is, and I always say I have little, I have a little band of little people in my head who, um, you know what I mean, and some, uh, they just sort of pop up and one just yeah. sort of doubts and doubts and that one just gets bitch slapped and told to sit down and, but, yeah. you know what I mean, that thing, you always have it, it's like, you know, it's sort of that, there's having three small children downstairs who managed to escape the clutches of Nana and sprint so fucking fast up these stairs. <laughs> um, yeah, but then you have this whole kind of, well, I'm trying to work and this is embarrassing. And then I'm very quick to go, who gives a shit? You know what I mean? I'm a mum of three and it's half past seven at night in lockdown. Exactly. Virtually, I'm hiding in my bedroom trying to do this. So it's what it is. It's exactly. that I, think, it, I find being unapologetic is how Good. I've sort of backed myself more. And the older I've got, the more I've just gone, do you know what? I'm not going to apologise for just being me and having a life and being human and having all, all yeah, all those sort of, Things look at the phenomenal on. things that you continue then to achieve with all of this going around you. We've got to own that. We think that I mean, in sports, in in the things that you do, Ems, in the things that I do, that in the wider world, we've got to come off as perfect. Oh, it's polished. Oh, it's for the Instagram. It's for this and that and the other. And a lot of it's bollocks anyway. So mm. when, <laughs> you, when you're allowing yourself to show up in that way and be unapologetic and be within your masculinity or your femininity or whatever it is that you want to be in it, and or, or you know, you want to be in your powerful body, then mm. it's being an apologetic that really rocks it that's that's yeah. how you can see that hey that's someone who's backing themselves for sure yeah, yeah. but how do you how do you all go no I mean, you go first see it's that handling handling failure and handling criticism and actually you're sort of quite similar to marilyn and you're you're in sport where it's an ind individual sport apart from the the team relay mask um the individual sport where there's a winner and there's a hell of a lot of losers that you know what i mean it's sort of it's not a big team thing you know you're playing in you know a football team or something they it's individual and it's you and you either win or you lose um how do you how have you learned to, how do you deal with that how do you deal with oh i lost and not it's not it not being a failure if that makes sense because obviously it's not failing but that kind of that feeling of i've i've, I've lost i haven't won was that question for me? Was yeah, that you, you go first, no, I mean, then I'll, yeah. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if that was for me or Marilyn. No, I mean, you touched on a really great point. Like, I, for us, you know, it's an individual sport. Obviously, we have our team, so it is a team sport to an extent. But when we're on the track, there's more than just one other competitor on the field with you. So, it, essentially, you do a lot more failing than you do succeeding, unless, you know, you lose Hamilton and you're very fortunate to be extremely talented and have a great team behind you and all of that good stuff there's a lot of failing and i think what i've really trained myself to do is to is to realize that failing is not a permanent condition it's something that comes and goes same as adversity, <laughs> whether it be struggle it comes and goes it's not going to be like that forever so bask in it for a little minute accept the failure and figure out you know how to how to achieve better the next time um, and, you know, it's it's a really strong mindset to be able to see the best in negative situations. And that's what you basically have to push yourself to do, because if you just focus on the negative, that's not going to help you move forward. Yeah. What about you, Marilyn? Yeah, so true. Like, I don't know, I guess with with what I did, you're just always wanting that feedback. So if I didn't quite have the race that I wanted... I just I relish the next opportunity to get it right. Um, so, and I, I very early I learned not to um, let my wins take me too high or my lows too low. The stuff that I was battling was expectation from outside um, entities and egos because with coaches comes a lot of egos and it was almost like I was just a racehorse and this whole chat was going on and if I didn't race according to how they wanted then drama and I'm just like I'm cool what's wrong with you get your stuff <laughs> but you know, I'm human and it would impact me and especially when it came to big decisions like funding and you know politics of sport which is a whole nother world and then ultimately you know sport is a big business so the higher the stakes got the, um, you know, the more pressure, but, you know, pressure produces diamonds. And for me, <laughs> Faye has been my fuel for a long, long time, you know, um, books coming out, Fuel by No, December 21. Um, but it literally has, that's what's kept me going. Now, when it started to impact my mental health, that's when I had to really reassess things because it could only push me for so long before it got really toxic. And actually I was having physical manifestation of chronic pain and, you know, I couldn't perform anymore. 
Um, so that's where, you know, I had to really make sure that I was just being my authentic self and being realistic at, you know, what I was going to get out of a race. Because I always say winners don't always come in first place. And I think when you start in athletics, it's all about winning. It's all about taking part. But the real, realist, you know, realistically, there can only be one winner. And when you're at an Olympic final, you know, the odds are pretty, you know, pretty low stacked against you, especially when there's <laughs> all over the place. But, um, you know, times are changing. But, yeah, it's just, you know, redefining what success is to you on any given day. And that's so important. Yeah, because I think it was sort of, I've spoken quite a lot with, with people on, you know, guests on it, is that the definition of success, like what? what is success because success is, is is different to everyone and i think people just see success as getting loads of money or winning or you know it's that sort of thing and i don't think many people actually stop and really think about what success is like danny to you what i mean what is success to you it's a really interesting one it's the one that i speak to probably my clients the most about is that what is their version of success because when they come to me they go hey i want to do a ted talk or hey i want to speak on stage and get paid loads of money to do it and i'm like okay cool why why do you give a shit about what you do why do you care and the and it's in there lies the success for me the success is right don't get me wrong a measure of success for me has been the house that i'm living in right now as you know i don't know i just don't know if i've mentioned it the house that i'm living in right now is the house i had to move into when i was homeless the house that i'm moving into this friday i get the games to on friday is my dream Ooh. house and that for me has been a measure of success it's been making enough money comfortably uh, for me and my family so that we can enjoy living in a safe area without my tires being slashed without my windows being put through and all of that kind of it's been a measure of success however i also know that on friday i get the keys to that house then what what do i do next like i want to attain something else am i going to buy something else and it's not about that first of all it was the attainment of safety and security and the nice surroundings i think that was the first yeah. thing and then it was realizing that everything that i do has a massive ripple effect every time i open my mouth is powerful every time i sh that with a client i get them to share what their mission is about what their business is about that's powerful because then they get to go and change other people's lives for me when i start to see that ripple effect when i start to see people sharing their messages like that whoa that's success i get to go to bed at night thinking yes i've achieved success and safety and security and a nice gaff for my family to live in i can travel a little bit that'll be nice when we can but <laughs> I can go to bed and I can go to my grave knowing that I've created a business that has got a legacy attached to it that's going to help people break cycles. That, that gives me goosebumps. That allows me to sit down and go, do you know what? I've impacted someone here. I've impacted somebody. They've gone on to impact somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. I'm like virtually fist bumping you here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but what are you, Naomi? What, what success to you? Difficult question. I think after after that statement, it's quite hard to measure what, what success is. And again, it's like... It's okay to be a Prada bag, Naomi. Prada bag. Money, money and trophies. Yeah. It's um, I think, I think it's, it's changed a lot and it keeps changing. And I think as long as I feel as though I'm progressing in what I'm doing, that is that to me is a success. Um, and again, back to the first topic of, of being a relatable role model for younger girls. If I feel that I'm impacting someone else's life, that to me is a success. Beautiful. Hey. <laughs> Marlon? Sorry. Yeah, what, what about you? Because obviously you're now, you see that might have, your definition of success might have changed. I mean, you're literally in that transition period now yeah. so what that didn't see if someone to now what what does success look like to you now yeah i mean i think when i was competing i never really was that person that had to win it was all about my performance so you know if we'd been training to run a certain time i think i was quite time orientated and i had these career goals and i wanted to smash records so to me i could come eighth in a race but hey i'd run 158 so you you know i was happy um, and again, it was like the outside, you know, perspective and obviously medals means everything. Um, but I always say my life is not measured in the medals that I've won. And, you know, three of them I got back in retrospect because of drugs sheets. So 
to me, it suddenly didn't mean anything. It was actually about the journey and that amazing word that Queen Bee just used there, legacy. And that's what I'm entering that phase of, you know, it's legacy building time for me. And I'm on this mission to, you know, revolutionize the culture because athlete welfare is, is really poor. And if you're in the 1% club, yeah, life is going to be sweet, pretty much. You're going to, you know, going to make that money. But I, I consider myself to be in the 99% and I've got medals. I've got Olympic medals. I've got European bronzes and world championship medals. But it's still been a battle. And I've gone through some ridiculous things. That I just wish, you know, I don't want the next anyone to have to go through that nonsense. So it's about having these conversations. It's about, you know, we just had that zero, um, zero no tolerance policy to abuse in sport, you know, things like that, it should never even really have got to that stage. Like, why isn't there a policy where a coach, after abusing an athlete, he should be back. He should be banned for life. He should be able to come back. So for me, I definitely want to make some noise at, at this institutional level and systemic level. But I also, you know, want to, what we're doing with building the Love, Ath Love Athletes platform is provide like a 360 holistic model of support where, you know, the journey, you know, and I want athletes to think about retirement as an extension of them not just like oh my god I have to completely reinvent myself because you go through so much emotionally when you're deciding you know it took me a good three years to decide to retire so that's you know a lot of deciding to come back oh no I won't and you know start stop but actually freedom came when I actually was purposeful and intentional and I thought actually I'm gonna I am proud of myself I had to realize that actually I've done a lot um, but for, for a good two years, I was feeling like a failure. And to people on the outside, that made zero sense. Um, but it was, you know, it was everybody else's stuff. So I had to just go back to my authentic self and realize actually, and yeah, from, you know, a girl from Stonebridge, council estate, from bridge to Olympic stadiums, that's that's incredible. So I'm still you're working. Remind, you've got to remind yourself, it. haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we move, we move. So Yeah, you've got to remind yourself, take a step back and remind yourself of what, what you've done but all of you like when you listen to all three of you um talking about success and there's that purpose there's a mission there's, there's a legacy it's kind of do you think because i know personally that when it stops when your purpose and mission becomes bigger than you as an individual that actually you do i know i back myself more and that kind of being unapologetic because it's more it, i'm just a messenger if that makes sense it's sort of it kind of do you think that helps when you take then when the ego goes and it stops being so all consuming and it's actually you're able to sort of look ahead and and see the bigger picture and see actually the purpose and the the big the big world out there of the, of the legacy in it exactly. what do you think Danny? it was when i was working in corporate it was really easy to pull a sickie because although I was very loyal to the company, I didn't really care. I wasn't really making a massive impact. So I didn't fly out of bed every morning. In fact, I probably pressed snooze more times than I care to mention because I didn't really care. I wanted my page. I wanted to go to work and do as little as possible and get paid as much as I possibly could to do as little as possible. And most of that involved scrolling on Facebook and then handing something in maybe at the end of the day. When I started to do this work, I get up in the morning and I'm flying out of bed. I can't wait to get online. I can't wait to talk to who I'm going to talk to on my show. Can't wait to do this sort of stuff. When we finish up here, I'm going directly straight to a mastermind that I'm running. We're planning events. Like I can't help it. My husband and my mum, my mum's like minded kiss. She goes, do you not want to just slow down? I'm like, I can't. <laughs> because it, it's so magnetic to yeah. me to see the, yeah. the change that we get to. Because when you start to understand your power, you can't help it. It, it becomes, it, like you say, it becomes bigger than you. You're doing, when you've got gifts and talents and strengths and you're able to work within your field of zone of genius and joy, <laughs> then you are doing the people that you can serve a disservice by not like you 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 are cheating people out of becoming better by not throwing yourself into the arena and i think that's really it sounds quite like it's not even from an ego space you do just become the channel for it and you think well i've got to show up today because otherwise someone's got to be fucked somewhere and you're not going to be able to reach out hand and say hey it doesn't have to be like that come on damn sorry i'm so swearing 
That's all right. <laughs> well, it's sister. We're sorry. I couldn't. I couldn't actually change if I couldn't. Swear. I just, I'm never going to do daytime TV. That's for sure. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I neither are you, Danny. Let's just hope for a late night show every night. Put me on like Channel Four late at night. It'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. I can do late at night. But just finally, um, touching on because a lot of a lot of what how holds women back is is confidence. It's the lack of confidence. It's that. Uh, it's the voices in your head saying you're not good enough and people are going to think you're a dick even saying stuff out loud and um so what how do you deal what are your methods and go-to methods all of these for like dealing with criticism not just external criticism but that we're so the voice in our heads especially women we're so harsh on ourselves the way we beat ourselves up and it stops us doing what with men, you know, the potential. So many women I know don't do it because they've just got this bitch in their head telling them that, you know, to stop rating themselves. So, Marilyn, what, what, what are your tips and advice on 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 dealing with the criticism? I mean, opinions. They're like everyone's got one, like a butthole, you know, but they're not all really useful. So, you have a really solid tribe around you whose opinions actually matter. And that actually are going to shape your life in some way. So whether it's positive or negative, you know that they are genuinely coming from a place where they care about you. And then everyone else is, you know, it's like, yeah, OK, I appreciate it. But is it going to serve me? If it does, great. If it doesn't, sorry, it's got to go. So that's kind of how I've navigated because I've had so many opinions dictating so much. And, you know, a, the system that I was in didn't even I didn't I didn't look at the board level and see anyone that would understand my journey uh, through foster care through you know both parents being in prison and you know going to elite boarding schools and having this dual life no, they didn't understand that and then coming and being a 400 800 runner no one understood that so the people that were around me that were living this life with me and traveling with me and had that empathy and didn't want me to fall down the dark hole, those opinions that mattered. And you just have to be super, super, um, you know, intentional in what you allow into your space and to infiltrate your energy in your mind. Um, so that, yeah, that'd be my tip. Just, you know, have the right tribe around you. And then in dealing with sort of the self-criticism, the little voices in your head, what are your sort of go-to methods daily <laughs> that, yeah, tell them to shut down, shut up and sit down? Oh yeah, my chimp. She's like <laughs> crazy. She's crazy, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Listen, <laughs> sometimes I just have to, you know. Have, have. No, um, I, no one's going to be harsher on you than yourself, and you, you know, I do do a lot of affirmations now, which I never really used to do, um, but they're powerful. And actually, it's about really believing what you're saying. So I don't leave that mirror until I believe it. And some days I'm like, yes, God, you're God, you are this, you're that, and it's just flowing. And some days it's really hard to say. Um, and I, I literally stay there until stay all day. Pull up a chair, get the wine. All day, yeah. if I, if I can spend, <laughs> start again, that's what happens. So you know, there are those days, and that's the reality of it. And and what we have to realise is that everyone goes through, you know, some shit. There we go. Us four. Um, <laughs> We all do. So let's stop pretending that we've got it all together all the time because that's just not, that's impossible and it's fine. You know, some days you're queening, some days you're lying in bed or in my case, Netflix mm. and on the couch. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. right. And what about you, Naomi? I would say, I mean, I would say there's probably three parts to this. The first one would be having your ducks in a row. And, and doing all the hard work you can so that when those bumps in the road show up or when that criticism comes up, whether it be from yourself or someone else, you can truly say to yourself, okay, I've done everything I can. Um, and then having your North Star or your, your reason for success that we spoke about before, because if you have that, and so I mean, we spoke about it all, it's now a little bit less selfish and, and more about other people potentially for us, remembering that in those moments, makes it easier as well you remember okay i'm not just doing this for myself like let's get up let's go let's do this for someone else as well um and then the last thing is that understanding that those bad moments are character building like it's it's hard right now and it's okay to take a step back and like feel that but it makes you stronger like you're going to wake up the next day with thicker skin you're going to be more prepared more conscious and and a better version of yourself i believe and how do you deal um deal with the little voices the little men the little men in your head that need to 
being knocked about sometimes? <laughs> uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. It, it, I mean, I think everybody has those issues. Some days it's better. Some days it's worse. Some days, you know, they, they over, overwhelm you and some days you it's easier to brush them off. But I think, again, if you if you believe in yourself and what you're doing and you feel super prepared, it's easy to fight those things off. So just work hard, believe in yourself, and and then you can fight those those voices off. Mm. And just know they're there, aren't they? I've sort of learned to live with them and just say, right, just have a cup of tea. And sometimes, and sometimes them. listen to them. Sometimes listen to them because not every negative information is necessarily bad for you. Sometimes you need to hear something like that to, to push you a little bit more or to to make you, you know, look at things from a different angle and try to work differently at things. Yeah. And what about you, Danny? The lot of voices are really interesting for me. Really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. That There are two sets, I find. Mm -hmm. One is the initial. When something goes on or something happens or you're about to do something, the loudest voice, the voice you hear initially, are uh, is the bit of you, the biological you, the ego bit of you that wants to keep you safe. Because success... Mm -hmm. And coming through the other side of whatever adversity this thing is, and that adversity or stress could be a race, could be getting on stage and singing a song, could be delivering something, whatever it is. <clears throat> it could be a presentation that somebody makes to get a job that they want. The voices that you hear in your head are voices that are trying to keep you safe. And mm -hmm. safety, your body's, your body's job, your brain's job is to try and keep you alive. And it does not know that that level of success is safe. It doesn't have any idea. It only knows that so far what you've done has kept you alive. So anything different to this isn't safe. So the, the loudest voice is, oi, this isn't safe, hang on. So then it's going to try and convince you that this isn't safe. So it might be that people will think you're foolish or that, you know, they'll think you're not better or whatever it is. And then it's allowing that and be curious. Okay, you're trying to keep me safe. I get it. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me safe. You've kept me safe so far. However, there is a quieter voice, a lower voice, a deeper voice, kind of sits for me around my solar plexus and my sacrum, like sits around here, goes really deep. And it's that voice that goes, actually, no, you've got this. This is your purpose. This is the reason why you're doing it. You've got to lean into this. Yes, this is keeping you safe. And you get to be curious about that then. You get to say, okay, you're trying to keep me safe. Is this logical? Is this rational? What are the outcomes actually going to be here? Or is this going to serve me? If the answer is yes, 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 let's go. Let's go and do it. If it's actually, are you keeping me safe? Is this going to be a genuine outcome? Is the outcome going to be not good? Am I being irrational here in this thinking? Mm -hmm. Then Check in with that voice in your belly. What's your belly saying? Is your belly saying, my belly's telling me that I want to get some Prosecco from the fridge. But like, <laughs> it's listening to that quieter voice within yourself. The initial voice that you hear is you trying to keep you safe. And that takes the form of your mum or your aunties or your teachers or your coaches or people who've employed you before. It'll take that form. And, and they'll serve themselves up to you in your voice, so you'll not be able to tell the difference. But those initial voices, you get to get curious. Say, hey, okay, you're trying to keep me safe. What are you keeping me safe from? Is this rational? No? Okay, cool, let's go. And then, and we're not encouraged to listen to ourselves in this way. And so when you realise that you can, and you can get still with it and sit with it, then you can start to make some really great decisions about moving yourself forward and allowing yourself to push through those really difficult things. Amazing. Nice, Danny, nice. But that's amazing. So, this, so before we end, just a final, final like one liner of sitting. I've done it for you already, now. Um, just to go again. Um, so if you were sat with your like sort of 17, 18 year old self in front of you, what would your, what would you say? To, what would you look them in the eye and say to them right now? Danny, go. I love you. 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 I'd say it again and again and again. It'll make me cry saying it <laughs> because she didn't feel it. Even though like, my mum loved me and the people around me absolutely loved me, I would tell her again and again uh, that everything that you're doing and you're going to fuck up and it's going to be horrific and you're going to hate it and you're going to cry and every step of the way and I love you and we are going to get this really nice house on Friday in 2021 <laughs> sometime. You're going to move your kids in there and your kids are going to be dead happy when you move in there and I love you. That's what I'd say. Oh, Naomi. Firstly, believe in yourself. Don't don't ever stop believing in yourself. Keep dreaming. Never give up on that dream. Uh, no matter who has an opinion on it, don't let them turn the volume down on your ambition ever. I like that. So Marilyn. <laughs> oh, I would say you are enough. Everything you need is within you. And that little voice, listen to her and just let it get louder and louder and use it because once you do you're just not going to stop which is what's happened so 
Yeah, just you are enough. Like it's just crazy the amount of people that don't realize that they are. That's they quite are. simple, isn't it? Just mm. you are enough. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But do you know what? Thank you so much. That was amazing, and we could just sort of carry on talking for hours. And as I said at the beginning, your energy, all three of you, it's sort of you just get the energy through a screen where it takes a lot. So okay. heroes, all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's been amazing. Housewarming from the day, Danny. Yeah, everyone yeah. round at mine. It's like don't tell anyone we're in lockdown, but shh. <laughs>